Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, my name is Tian de Jager. I'm the Dean in the Faculty of Health Sciences, and it's my privilege to be your program director this afternoon for this 21st UP Expert Lecture on the drug everybody should take, why, how, and what, by Professor Martin Schwellness from our faculty. Um, the presentation will be live-streamed, so I think there will be specifically a, a lot of students joining because of the title. They might think there's a new drug becoming available. Um, but uh, we welcome also our external guests that will uh, join us via the Internet. Um, 21 is indeed a landmark, and I would like to acknowledge the VC, Professor Cheryl de Ray. It's her brainchild and her initiative, and we're all benefiting from this event. Uh, indeed, always intellectual stimulating, and we're also looking forward to tonight's topic that is very relevant in our times and also speak to one of the sustainable development goals, specifically good health and well-being. I would like to call uh, on Professor Delaray, our host, to do the official welcoming and also to introduce our speaker. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and allow me to welcome all our distinguished guests this evening particularly our expert lecturer, Professor Martin Schwalness, and his family. It's really wonderful to have you and your family on the same occasion. And may I say to the family who have just moved to Pretoria, welcome to Pretoria. As you've heard, ladies and gentlemen, that this is the 21st lecture in the university's expert lecture series. And tonight, you will see a few innovations, one of which has already been mentioned, that this event is being live streamed to a wider audience. So perhaps it's an opportunity to remind you that uh, in a, any inappropriate body language, uh, sleeping, <laughs> this is not the time. Uh, but on a more serious note, this series was introduced in the year 2010 when at the time we reflected on the importance of sharing the expertise of our academic leaders with the broader public audience. So what we do is strive to provide a public platform for our UP experts to engage with the general audience on significant developments in their fields of expertise, and particularly to suggest areas of knowledge that are likely to have an impact on our lives in the future. And I believe that the objective that we started out with in 2010 has become more important today than ever before. I think most of us are now familiar with the term post-truth. It was the Oxford English Dictionary's word of the year for 2016, post-truth. The term is used to describe the world we live in today, the post-truth era, they call it, where, and I quote, objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal beliefs, where opinion is more valued than empirical truth, and where our entitlement to an opinion reigns supreme. The post-truth society seems to be characterized by populism, where people rely on peers rather than experts, and the phenomenon that is now called fake news has become rather ubiquitous in our society. And of course, it's fueled by technological innovations such as the social media we've become to rely on. And we now live in a world where everyone's opinion counts equally, it's disseminating at lightning speed, and our world has become one of many truths. But science in general, and universities in particular, are by their very nature associated with empirical truth or objective truth. And in the words of two authors whom I read recently, now more than ever, scholars must develop strategies to communicate the results of our research to the public as a means of challenging alternative facts and of influencing policy making. 
So the topics we select for our University of Pretoria's expert lecture series are indeed topical and relevant. In order for us to ensure that we use this platform as another opportunity to communicate the results of our research conducted by scientific methodology to the public in general, but also thereby influencing public opinion and policy making. And over the years, as I look back over our 21 lectures, we've covered topics ranging from human rights, stem cell research, issues related to minorities such as sexual minorities, energy efficiency to the digital highway. And tonight, I'm intrigued because we are here to learn about a drug that we should all be taking. So Prof. De Jager, you thought it might appeal particularly to students, but it might appeal even more particularly to those of us who are aging and I have hopes for a drug <laughs> that might bring eternal youth or at least the appearance of eternal youth. So we are intrigued by this title and look forward to the lecture this evening to be delivered by Professor Martin Schwellness, who is Professor of Sport and Exercise Medicine within the University of Pretoria's Faculty of Health Sciences. Very briefly, Professor Schwellness is a specialist sports and exercise medicine physician who regularly consults athletes at all levels he holds an MBA, BCA, BCH from the University of the Witwatersrand, cum laude, and an MSc in Medicine, and then an MD from the University of Cape Town. He's the director of our newly established Sport, Exercise, Medicine, and Lifestyle Institute here at the University of Pretoria, and he's also the director of the International Olympic Committee, IOC, Research Center in South Africa. He's a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine, as well as of the International Sports Medicine Federation. Prof. Schwellness is also a long-standing member of the IOC Medical Commission, the Med Medical and Science Group, and a member of the editorial board of a number of international journals, including the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And he has published, and wait for it, over 300 scientific articles and is, he has extensive national and international research and clinical collaborations. Truly an expert in his field. Professor Schwellness, I look forward to learning about this drug we should all be taking. Welcome. Thank you. Professor Delaray, thank you very much for the introduction and I think most importantly, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here this evening and to deliver the expert lecture. It's really an honour and a privilege for me to do that. I uh, also want to acknowledge the other uh, members of the Senior Executive of the University of uh, Pretoria that are here. I see some of you around. Thank you for your support since I've uh, arrived uh, some now two years ago. And I also want to thank you all for coming and spending a bit of time with us. So, this lecture is going to be slightly different. For one thing, uh, the announcement that you have to switch off your phones is out. You have to switch on your phones. Uh, maybe you can put the sound off. Uh, we are going to uh, play a game. As you'll know, and uh, I want to just acknowledge my children, we, you know, playing games is part of what I am. So I'm going to be back a 16-year-old this evening. So let me start straight away. And um, talk a little bit about the drug that everybody should take. Um, and the why and the how and the what um, of this drug. So uh, first, a few acknowledgements. I, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my Heavenly Father who has given me some talents and uh, I want to thank him for allowing me to develop these talents in my work as well in order to help people along the way. Also want to ex uh, give thanks to my family, my wife Rihanna over there who's been with me for, I worked out in the run this afternoon before I came, it's over 33 years that we got married, but we've been known, known each other for much longer than that. And then my children, thanks uh, guys for being here this evening. Uh, just on a sideline, thanks for the squash game last night, it was good, enjoyed that. And thank you to my extended family, some of whom are pictured here, also my, my parents, uh, father passed away, my mother's uh, 
is, is in Johannesburg but couldn't come t this evening. I also want to thank a little bit of my history. I want to thank particularly my UCT colleagues. Some of the research I'm talking about, I've been working with these people and I want to thank them uh, you know, for their uh, contribution to, to developing me and my career. Um, I also want to uh, thank my newly, uh, and some not so newly, I've known some of my colleagues at UP for a long, long time, but I want to thank them very much. Dion, thanks very much for you and your faculty, your support, and Krista, Hansa also here, and uh, all the other people at the HPC and, uh, and on the sports campus. I also want to acknowledge my international collaborators. These are just uh, the main ones I've put on here. Uh, my roots are at uh, Wits University in Cape Town and now in Pretoria, but I have uh, connections, good friends, um, colleagues uh, overseas, also students that I've examined and have um, been part of, and I want to thank them as well. So this is the time that uh, the lecture is going to be slightly different. So I'm going to ask you to get your smartphones and your tablets ready. And um, you should be able to connect to the internet. Uh, some of you that are visitors, you would have had a password given for the tax guest um, password. So I want you to do that. If you're a UP uh, student or employee, then of course you can connect to EduRome. And uh, the next thing is uh, that you need to go to this particular website. Uh, just type that in, www.menti.com. And then you should have a screen that um, is, uh, opens up uh, on the right-hand side. And uh, I will open up the, uh, a code, a number that you'd have to type in there. And um, later on in the questions, you'll be given an opportunity to put a name in. That is because we run a competition. And there is a prize, actually. Uh, it contains um, a book, a pen, and goodness, a voucher for free study at the University of Pretoria. Thanks very much for that, <laughs> Professor. Not really. Don't take, don't take my word for that. But uh, I wish it was. <laughs> Um, so there is, a, there is a competition. So the way the competition works and the way the questions work is during the presentation, I'm going to switch over to this uh, website. Then uh, you'll be able to um, see questions on your, will be displayed on your phone. There are some questions that are just uh, opinions. So there's no, uh, you know, just you select and you, you'll see on your phone and you, you submit it. But I will give you a warning uh, that there, when there's a question coming up that gives the competition part, and that you've got 20 seconds to answer, and it is all on an automatic point scoring system to get this fantastic prize. And the faster you get the right answer, the higher the point scoring. So it's not about just getting the right answer, but you've, do, you've got to do it quickly. You know, in medicine, you have to make some quick decisions sometimes, so this is what it's all about. Um, in some cases, and I'll indicate there may be more than one correct answer, and uh, the results will be displayed on the screen and then right at the end. If everything goes well, this is a technical challenge for all of us, but if everything goes well, we'll have a, a prize winner at the end. All right, so uh, let's, um, if you're ready, then um, I'm going to uh, get you the first question on the screen. And you should be able to log on. And what I want you to do is I want you to put that number, 743599. That's the number to put in. Okay, so you can put it in straight away, and let's see who we're dealing with. At the moment, it's all the young people, because that's quite obvious, because they are the ones that get to... You know, you've got to be under the age of 25, then this is not a technological challenge for you at all. But you see, the poor, older age group are either not represented, <laughs> or they are not uh, able to access. I just want to ask Lynette. Lynette, is, are there people that can help uh, around students, you know, under the age of 25? If there are any people who struggle, maybe put up your hand and some of the young, young guys can help you. All right, so that's interesting. So that's, the, that's who we are. Um, I'm also going to ask for those people that are live streaming. Uh, there may be some that are, you know, in London or in Cape Town or elsewhere. Uh, and I'm speaking to you as well. You are welcome to join in exactly the same way. The code is 743599 on www.menti.com. And you can access this as well, and you're very really happy to do that. All right, so uh, that's uh, the first question. So let's, uh, let's uh, get a little bit more serious now uh, and ask you... <laughs> Uh, this may be very obvious or it may not be obvious at all about what the favorite South African 
uh, super rugby rugby team is. And so you're welcome to put your, your answers in there, and there are 43 responses at the moment. Um, and you can keep going. We're probably going to sort of stop until we're at about uh, 68 to 70 or so. So it's quite clear that we are in the right place, which is Pretoria. <laughs> it would have been an embarrassment if it was the Stormers, but um, I know, Adrian, you waited for the Stormers. But <laughs> okay. So that was a bit of fun, and that's just an introduction. So we're going to do this, um, uh, you know, as we, as we go along. So let's, um, let's move over to the presentation. And I, I'm going to, uh, I would like to acknowledge Stephen Ball. Stephen, where are you? Stephen, Stephen. We were on a run, and, and I was discussing the, the expert lecture with Stephen, and Stephen said to me, now, I need to, I need to consider this. And Simon Sinek uh, is a um, motivational speaker, principally, and uh, he wrote a book in 2009 which had a very intriguing title, uh, and it says, Start With Why. Uh, and the title of the book is How Great Leaders Inspire Everyone to Take Action. So I don't consider myself a bright leader, but, but what I think is it may be useful to inspire action. So this evening is all about inspiring an action, a particular action. And I'm going to uh, go through the why and the how and the what. He calls it the golden circle. So let's start with the why. So the why and the how and the what, um, most people would start with the what. And most people know what they do daily, can recall that quite well, your work, your habits, eating, sleeping, function, other things you do. Some people uh, know how they do things differently to others, or maybe even from the day before. Uh, and these are the things, the activities or habits that you do that set you apart from other people. Uh, or from what you've done before. But very few people, very few people, really know why they would do that, why they do these things differently. And that is because, that is to understand the purpose or the cause or the belief that is behind doing things differently. So this evening, we're going to start uh, with the generation of what is known as a why statement. And a why statement uh, clearly expresses the unique contribution or decision or action uh, and its impact. And it comes down to the impact is measured, if you like, by the difference you want to make in your life or perhaps in others. And the contribution is that one decision or action that you're going to take uh, towards making this impact. And that these two components are a really good filter to, to make decisions. So the purpose of this afternoon or this evening is really to generate, and this is what I'd like to come to right at the end of this, to generate a why statement that will make the biggest impact on our health, on your health, and on my health, and of the health around us, our family, our friends, and our patients, and our employees, depending on which sector um, you are working with. So the question is, what is your why statement today? And I'm going to come back to this. At the end of the day, we're also going to, all we're going to answer this question. When I leave this room over there today, I'm going to do something, act something, for my health and for those around me. So I'll please remember that, that why statement. That is the purpose of this evening's lecture. It's only one thing, is to generate a why statement for health. It may be that this evening's lecture is the most important thing that you've done for your health in your entire life. But we'll judge that at the end. So the question is, if, I, if there was a drug that I could take, one thing, one action I could take every day um, that will make a difference to my health, then the why question is, why should I consider taking this drug? And understanding that why is the key to this. So let me tell a little bit about my story. And I've got a few slides on that. Uh, my wife, Rihanna, will remember this incident very well because it was a disturbing incident in my internship at the Helen Joseph Hospital in J.G. Stratum. And it concerns a patient that I had got to know over my time in the medical ward, a Mrs. J. She was about 67 years old. She was a delightful lady. And she was admitted to hospital repeatedly. So after a while, when all the interns and everybody got to know her quite well. Her problem was severe shortness of breath due to a chronic lung disease, known as a chronic obstructive pulmonary or obstructive lung disease, as a result of smoking. And she effectively was in what we would call a respiratory failure. She was moving in and out of respiratory failure. And each admission 
She would come in, short of breath, blue, needing oxygen, and we would stabilize her, and it was quite a nice physiological exercise, working with drugs and fixing the number of oxygen and so on. And, and after three or four days, we would discharge this lady uh, at home. But one night at 2 o'clock in the morning, the doctor gets called first. He's the intern, in fact, the junior intern. So I was called at 2 o'clock in the morning by the nursing sister to come and look after Mrs. J. And I asked her, what's the problem? She said, no, doctor, I can't tell you. Better just go into the ward. And I came into the ward, and Mrs. J had found somewhere a pair of scissors, blunt scissors, which she had around her neck like that. And she, was go and she said to me, doctor, don't come here. I'm going to cut myself. Anyway, it took about some time for me to sit down with her, talk to her, and eventually got the scissors away. We'd stabilized her. We discharged her a few days later. But she died a few weeks later with a long-standing chronic suffering disease. The cause, as I indicated, was chronic obstructive airways disease, and the result was because of a habit, a smoking habit, an action she took about her health some time ago for many years. And it... That's one of the, the chronic obstructive lung disease or chronic lung disease, one of the non-communicable diseases. And it's a disease that's preventable. And so that was a pivotal moment for me. I, there were many others, but that was a pivotal moment in my very, very early career to start thinking about it. I was, we were, I was a very good, or we were very good, at curing this thing in the hospital. We could give drugs and oxygen and so on and get a right discharger. But we had done nothing to prevent it. And so that was one of the reasons why I decided to go into a branch of medicine which didn't exist at the time, which is in sport and exercise medicine. And so for many years later, I've been involved in trying to, uh, you know, develop this branch of medicine. You can read some of the history in, this, in, the, in the monograph that was uh, distributed. And develop this branch of medicine that will focus on prevention, not on cure. And use habits and lifestyle to make a difference, not so much drugs and medication. So, sport and exercise medicine at the moment in South Africa is on the brink of becoming a brand new infant medical specialty, which we're very excited about. And I was very privileged in 2011 to be part of an international expert group. Maybe that's, uh, that's one reason I could possibly be called an expert. Not that I was an expert, but I was part of this group. To uh, investigate, discuss, and then publish in a very reputable journal um, a a, a piece around the responsibility of this profession or some medical profession, but we think sport and exercise medicine is a good profession, to prevent and manage chronic disease and how we could apply our knowledge in athletes and habits that uh, we instill in athletes and how we could do that in patients. And so this is one of the most cited articles of mine that I was part of publishing. I was also part of another group, a consensus group convened by the IOC, also on chronic disease prevention and management. Again, with really, very, uh, you know, real expert people uh, on these groups. So, I think it's time to have some fun now. So, let's get your phones ready. And, uh, and we're going to um, get to the next question. And again, you've got to go to the same uh, website. And uh, this is also a question that you can answer at your leisure. It's not for points. And uh, the question is... Um, Think about diseases that are listed there and the pictures there that have been diagnosed in either yourself or in close family members. And you can take more than one of those and then submit it. And let's see uh, what percentage of people in the audience have had exposure to these four diseases. We've got 56. Um, live streaming. Wayno, if you're there live streaming from Cape Town or Stellenbosch, you're welcome to do that as well. And many other of my friends. So we will again stop at around 60, 70 around there. It's still more people. And the California. What time is it in California at the moment? <laughs> Early morning. But whoever in California, please vote. Uh, I know you Americans have got some problems with these things as well. All right, so we're going to stop at 75, and what I want to point out here is that this is not surprising. Cancer, heart disease, diabetes, a uh, very high percentage of you have had close exposure to those, to those chronic conditions. So let's move on to the next question. And so 
Yeah, we, I want you to all sign up, be ready. And this is a question, that's the first question with a quiz. All right, so now if you have been uh, uh, relaxing, this is time to up the adrenaline because now this is the time to get your free education at UP. Uh, this is the prize. Um, this is the first part. So we're gonna, uh, the way it works is I'm going to start the countdown. You've got 10 seconds. You're the, 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 the questions will be displayed on your phone. And you can choose an alias and a name, by the way. Just don't, nothing rude, please. I don't accept responsibility for the winner if it's a name. I mean, I, I think I've heard most names, but uh, you, know, you know what I mean. So there are 82 people, so let's go. We're going to start the countdown. You, there will be a 10-second countdown. And then after the question will be displayed, you've got 20 seconds to answer. But remember, the quicker you answer, the higher the points. There's one right answer. 17 seconds left. Ten. I see there are some people who are conferring. That's okay. You can confer on this as long as you share the prize. All right. So the answer is that uh, 65 uh, uh, people percent answered lifestyle diseases, infectious diseases, and violent deaths. So I'm going to show you the leaderboard. Let's just see who got the answer quickest. Uh, all right, we'll have to see about the display, but there's an M there that's got 899 points. All right, so let's talk a little bit about these uh, lifestyle diseases or the non-communicable diseases. So what are these non-communicable diseases? Well, they are diseases that are lifestyle related as I've indicated. And I'm giving you some facts now, some frightening facts. So this is not surprising based on what we've just heard. Is that lifestyle or non-communicable diseases kill 65% of all people worldwide today. The problem is it's getting much worse. A few years ago it was 55%, now it's 65%. So this is a problem that's getting much worse. It's not, getting, uh, any, it's not being solved. It's not being solved anywhere in the world at this point. Now, out of these non-communicable diseases, there are four disease groups. We've had them listed in pictures before that are responsible for 82% of all those deaths. So the, by far the majority of people in the world today die from cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, and diabetes. Varies a little bit in terms of the population. Now, you may say to yourself, well, you know, that's the whole world. In Africa, we have other problems, and, I, and we do. So what about non-communicable diseases in Africa? What is the probability of dying from a non-communicable disease if you live in Africa compared to other regions of the world? And so this is a slide that shows the probability on this scale and in the major areas around the world. And it comes from the WHO Global Status Report on Non-Communicable Disease. And we are only second to Southeast Asia, similar to the Eastern Mediterranean, but certainly much worse than any of the others, certainly much worse than Europe and the United States. But that is Africa as a whole. What about non-communicable diseases in Africa, in South Africa, and what is the probability of dying from one of these four main diseases? If you are between the age of 30 and 70, which most people in this room were, what is the probability of dying from a non-communicable disease in South Africa? So this comes from, a, this is a map, again, from the WHO, and it displays different colors over here. And this is the probability of dying. And the highest category is greater than 25% chance. And we are right there. In fact, we are worse off than in the majority of Africa. We are similar to, to, to uh, you know, Asia, but we are worse than ma the majority of Africa. So if I now look at, so these are WHO statistics, they may be a little bit older. There was a very interesting report from Stats South Africa, Statistics South Africa, released on the 28th of February this year, reporting on the mortality and the causes of death in South Africans. And this is a graph from that, from that publication. And it's the percentage expressed as the percentage of all deaths of South Africans from 1997 over there to 2015. So these are the data. And the graph shows really the three main groups of diseases in South Africans, that, or groups of causes of death. One is injuries, which seems to come down a little bit. 
Then there are the communicable diseases, which are HIV, TB, malaria grouped, and you can see what's happened to them, peaking around 2007, 2008, and showing a relative decrease. This is a relative decrease, not an absolute decrease, because it's relative to the others. This is the percentage. And the non-communicable diseases started high, and then relatively speaking to communicable diseases were about the same, slightly lower. And around 20, 2009, as predicted by many people, is climbing, 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 and unfortunately still climbing. So this is the biggest problem in South Africa as well. This is a slide that shows exactly the same, except that what I've done is I've combined injuries and, non and the communicable disease together, caused, called it injury communicable disease and NCDs, non-communicable disease, in one group. And we can still see a much higher chance of death from non-communicable disease in South Africans. So in 2015, more South Africans died as a result of non-communicable disease than a combined infectious or communicable disease and injuries together. So what is the biggest healthcare problem in South Africa? It should be really, really quite clear. So what is the drug that everybody in, Africa, in South Africa should take? In fact, in Africa, South Africa, and the rest of the world should take. And that is a drug that prevents non-communicable disease or treats non-communicable disease. That's the drug we need. So the why and the how and the drug, this is the drug we need. So it's time to get your phones back again. And we're going to play some games again. And I'm going to ask you to, as oh, you signed up already, I'm really excited about this. Let's see if we, hopefully we can have some people live streaming again. If you live stream from elsewhere, you're welcome to sign up, and I'm sure there are some people. I'm going to give them another few seconds to do that. Somebody opted out, actually. Really? Maybe that's a good thing. All right, we're going to start the countdown. Ten seconds to get ready. Look at your phones. And the question is, if I climb stairs for ten minutes every day, my life expectancy will, and then the options. Ten seconds left. This is for points, the prize. Free education. All right, this is clearly quite an educated audience. Let's see, the leaderboard, there was an M leaderboard. Let's just see where we are. It's been t taken over by someone else then. So just the competition is fierce. All right, uh, let's do the next question. And again, uh, I'm just going to wait for all the players to start. We had around 80 last time, so let's go. 80, that's quick, easy. 81, somebody joined, California. Start the countdown, 10 seconds. We're ready, next question. The question is, if I'm 55, 57 years old and currently not exercising but want to start jogging, I must. And then it gives you a few options. Seven seconds left. Okay, start a daily routine. Yeah, you see, maybe I can teach you something. All right, so let's move on, and I want to now look at what are the causes of these non-communicable diseases. And so you all heard about the, um, the seven deadly sins. It's well known. I call this the Schwellness Eight Deadly Sins of Non-Communicable Disease. So what are these things? Well, there are firstly four daily choices that we make every day. And that is, what do you eat? Do I use tobacco or other uh, similar drugs? Do I use alcohol in excess? Or am I going to not do any physical activity today? Those are four, four key choices we make every day. The first four sins. The other four are, to some extent, consequences um, of, um, of the other. But they're also, in a way, um, on their own. And these are more things that we measure <clears throat> when we see a doctor or a health professional. <clears throat> it's about blood pressure, being overweight, having a high blood sugar, 
or certain uh, types of fat in your blood that could be at a high concentration. So these are eight key uh, risk factors, if you like, or deadly sins of non-communicable disease. So the next thing I want to introduce is the complexity of the deadly web. This is the Schwellner's deadly web of chronic disease risk factors. How do these eight risk factors interact uh, by causing these four main groups of diseases? And it's quite a complex interaction. So you'll see some lines going from tobacco affecting cardiovascular, cancer, and chronic lung. Alcohol, cardiovascular, and cancer. Uh, obesity is quite an important one, cardiovascular, cancer, and diabetes, etc. Physical inactivity, can, uh, cardiovascular, cancer, and diabetes, etc. So it is quite a complex, and it becomes difficult to uh, tease out and make a decision if you had to choose to change one, one of these, which would you choose? The other question is, is it bad, you know, if I have one, is it as bad if I have many of these risk factors. And I want to show you some recent research from Australia, over 231,000 Australians, adults over the age of 45, where a really well-conducted scientific study was done, looking at the relative risk of dying from any cause, not just those, but any cause, against the number of these risk factors that I showed you in that web. If I had no risk factor against an accumulative number of these risk factors, what would be the graph? And you can see this is a graph that just goes up. If you have a high risk factor score, all of them really, you have a five times higher risk of dying than somebody who hasn't got any risk factor. So if you had made a mental note and said to yourself, well, I've got about two of these at the moment, then you've got a 1.7 chance, uh, chance of dying. If I have five of them, it's more closer to 4.6. So you may say to yourself, well, you know what? I'm too old already, I'm over the age of 65, this will make no difference anymore. I don't have to look at any of these. So let's look at the exact same picture for that age group, 65 to 80 years old. No risk, none of those risk factors against all of them. Really what this shows is an even higher uh, uh, risk if you have more risk factors if you're older. So if you're older, you should be doing and thinking about risk factors as much as somebody who's much younger. That's the message of the slide. You may also say, well, you know, I'm, I'm over the hill. <laughs> I have heart disease, blood vessel disease, or metabolic disease. And if I now start thinking about changing any of these risk factors, make no difference at all. And quite clearly, by this stage, you will have realized that the trend is the same, particularly if you have five or six of these risk factors goes up to seven and a half times, much higher than if you were, obviously, uh, you didn't have these heart disease and other, risk, uh, other existing diseases. Okay, so that's all the risk factors together. Can we come back to one of them? If you can only change one of them, what is the one thing that you can do, the one drug you can take to change one of them, and what will be the biggest difference? So let's look at what is the most important of those risk factors, the eight deadly sins. What is the most important one that kills most males? And then I'll show you this slide on females. It's not uh, that I'm sexist because of, I'm showing only the males. So here's a graph. This is a very important, this is a very good colleague of mine, Stephen Blair, um, from the United States. That they had a very large cohort of people. That's just a very large group of people they followed for a long, long time. And this is the attributable risk of each of these major risk factors. So that's if you uh, overweight. So if you're going to choose to have one, here I say, <laughs> maybe that's the better one. Don't have high blood pressure. And then here's cholesterol, diabetes, smoking. And then a good colleague of mine, a good friend of mine, Rihanna knows him very well, Karim Khan. Karim uh, coined a term, which you can Google. It's a new disease. It's called smoker diabetes. Smoking, diabetes, diabetes, I got it wrong, and obesity together. If I lump those one, two, three things together, and I call it a new disease called smoker diabetes, the single most important risk factor is still low fitness, not exercising, higher than high blood pressure in causing... Is this different for males and females? The, the patterns are slightly different. Smoker diabetes wins over high blood pressure in females, but still low fitness is higher than smoker diabetes, even in females. 
So the most important risk factor, the one thing, that if you want to change one thing only, I mean, I'm not saying for one moment we shouldn't do any of that. So please, my colleagues in the medical faculty, I'm not saying don't treat diabetes, but don't treat diabetes without treating low fitness. Then you're causing a cardinal sin. And in Australian males, this is slightly different, brings in a few other risk factors, it's exactly the same. And it also brings another risk factor, which if you combine, is prolonged sitting. So I'm surviving and you guys are dying right now. Because, because I'm standing and you are sitting. So it's not a good news. I'm going to get you to stand in a moment, don't worry. Because I'm, I love you all and I want you to, to, to survive and live longer. So again, this just makes exactly the same point. Physical inactivity and prolonged sitting as the single risk factor against all these others, highest risk of dying if you're an Australian adult. So my medical colleagues uh, may say there are some magic, magic drugs around, and I don't dispute that. What about uh, the one drug that the Americans at one stage were thinking of putting in drinking water to save Americans, like fluoride? Uh, and they were thinking about putting cholesterol-lowering drugs, this little touch of a statin, into the drinking water to, to cure most people. Is that not a magic drug? What about anti-diabetic drugs? So let's do a comparison if you treat uh, people that have got risk factors for heart disease, that's called primary prevention, with one of two things. You either give them a statin drug or you get them to exercise, which would have the biggest reduction in your risk of all-cause mortality, dying from anything. And you can see more than two times a greater reduction in risk if you exercise. Exercise is cheaper than statins also, by the way. <laughs> what about if you now take exactly the same group and you say, well, okay, you know, there could be other reasons for death. What about if you now focus on what statins are really good for? They are good for other things as well, by the way, but statins are good for cardiovascular disease. And you can see 25% reduction, but still better, than, uh, better to be active than to take a statin. So I'm not saying, like Tim got big into big trouble, we're saying stop statins. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if you take a statin, don't take a statin without exercising. That's what I'm saying. So another drug, magic drug for diabetes, is called metformin. And if you take metformin and you take, give it to people who are at high risk of becoming diabetic because they've already got a high blood sugar, they've got glucose intolerance, and I give those people a metformin drug, I'll reduce their risk of becoming diabetic, developing diabetes by 31%. That's good. But if you get them to exercise instead, no, sorry, should plus with, with exercise, but if you take them and give them exercise alone, you reduce it by almost 60%, double, double the reduction. So you may argue, well, you know, the best drug to take is a statin or the best drug to take is metformin, but I think the drug everyone should take in South Africa is regular physical activity. So we can all go and have some wine and snacks now. <laughs> but the question is, how many, physic uh, how many South Africans do actually take this? And again, I've just split this up in males and females. This is the same graph from the WHO. And we are in the sort of second darkest column, which is over there. And about 40 to 50 percent of South African males across the board over the age of 18 years do not take this drug. They're not active enough. Is it any better in females? It's worse. Females are worse. The one thing we we can males, if you want to have something, you know, we are bad, but not as bad as you <laughs> on the exercise part. All the other things, the ladies are better, but in exercise, we're not doing so well. So 50%, more than 50%, that's the highest category. It could even be more. I'm not sure what the number is. All right. So the next question now, going on to the how part of it. How will regular physical activity actually be of benefit to your health? And let me show you a few slides. But we first go, go and uh, go back to our friends. But now I am, and, and the seats are challenging in this. Uh, so you're going to have to wiggle, which is not bad for your neuromuscular control and balance. But please don't fall. But I'm going to ask you all this question. You can only answer. Your app will only work if you stand. <laughs> Sorry, that's not true. <laughs> but you, you're going to have to stand up for this. And that is only because I really want you to uh, live a bit longer.
Okay, so this is a, a slide that, um, that's asking you to make your why statement after you've heard what we've heard. And uh, we are sitting at 4.3 out of the definitely versus the not at all. Okay, that's good. One minute standing is excellent. <laughs> so let's go to the next uh, let's, uh, part of the presentation. Okay, so what are the health benefits of uh, regular physical activity? Well, I can't claim to be the innovator of this at all. It goes back to two and a half thousand years ago, really, uh, when uh, uh, Plato said, lack of activity destroys the good condition of every human being, while movement and methodological physical exercise saves it and preserves it. And really, that's the message. And... Uh, I'm going to now just go through some of the science behind uh, what does regular exercise do. The first question is, if I'm a regular exerciser, does it prolong my life? And the important question is, how am I, by how much does it prolong my life if I do it? And this, is, this picture shows kind of the levels of physical activity with no exercise on this one. Then a few... Uh, activities like walking slowly, this is walking slowly for an hour in a week, climbing stairs for 10 minutes per day, every day, uh, strenuous hiking for two hours, this is all in a week, cycling uh, at a reasonable uh, speed for three hours, and running uh, for two hours in a week. And you can see the benefits, your life expectancy, the life years gained after the age of 40, you can increase it by uh, up to almost five times, five years. So if you run five minutes, okay, or so, let's call it a reasonable pace for two hours in a week, you'll live five years longer, four to five years longer. So that's, that's not bad uh, for, a, uh, for any intervention. The risk of dying, we've kind of intonated that already. So this is, again, with these different exercises about... Um, uh, I, I think there was a question in, uh, that we had about the climbing of the stairs, which uh, prolongs your life. You got that right. And again, you're, you're, you're almost half your risk of dying uh, compared to somebody who's not exercising if you run for um, up to two hours. But notice that you can even get up to a 20% reduction just by walking and just by walking and climbing stairs. So it doesn't have to be running to start off with. I don't have time this evening to go through lots of the other benefits of exercise. It's probably one of the most expanding um, areas of research publications, and I get too many uh, every week because I can't keep up with it, uh, because I've, I'm linked to, to in information systems that give me the benefits of exercise. But I just want to give you a few of the other facts. This comes from the National Health Service website, which is a very good summary of all the benefits, NHS Choices. We, talk, we spoke about reducing early death and heart disease and diabetes, 50% reduction of getting cancer, 20% of breast cancer, 83% of getting a low, having a low risk of osteoarthritis. You can lower the risk of hip fractures, lower the risk of falls, particularly in older people. And very, very a topical, very interesting area to research is what does it do to your mind? And there's a 30% lower risk of depression, and a low risk of dementia. So exercise really is this magic drug that affects multiple organ systems, from your cardiovascular system to your brain to your uh, musculoskeletal system, etc. So it would be amiss of me not to talk about, if I talk about exercise as a drug, are there any potential side effects from this drug? And we have to consider that. And the answer is yes. It's not something that somebody can just go and take as much as they like, as fast as they like. And this is called in our literature the exercise paradox. And when I stand up here, which I have done heavily this evening, promoting physical activity, it is as much as I do that, it's my responsibility and that of my colleagues in the health professions to reduce the risk of these side effects. So I'm going to spend the next last, the last bit of this lecture 
talking about the side effects and how to reduce them, how to make exercise safer. And that's just being responsible as with any drug that we prescribe. So the first side effect is a risk of injury. And if you start engaging with exercise, in an exercise routine, whether this is recreational or in competitive sport, we know that there's an increased risk of a musculoskeletal injury. And Adrian, I can't help remembering the little tweak in the back on the squash court last night. You know, luckily, it's not too bad, but I mean, it is one of those things. So um, it is a risk. And just to give you two important statistics, in our own research, which we've published, 50 to 60 percent, more than half of people that start exercise when they have got either risk factors or existing non-communicable disease actually start off with having a, a musculoskeletal complaint to start off with. They haven't even done any exercise, but they already have a musculoskeletal complaint. And it's my responsibility to make sure that doesn't get worse. If we take uh, just recreational running, in one year, if you take 1,000 runners, about three to 500 of them, 30 to 50 percent, will end up with a running-related injury. And there are many other examples in rugby players. We've done lots of research in these different areas. So injury prevention is a key part of sport and exercise medicine and lifestyle promotion. So I'm going to give you 10 golden rules this evening, if you're thinking, which you should be, that you want to go exercise as we walk out. And in fact, some of you will have to climb these stairs whether you like it or not. <laughs> the first rule is if you're injured, get expert help. Because a previous injury is the single most important risk factor for another injury. Now, there's some things in my profession that are not too hard to grasp. That's one of them. Starting with a training program slowly and progress gradually. I'm going to speak a little bit about that in a moment. There's a bit of controversy about this, but it's always good to start an exercise session with a warm-up and a stretch beforehand. Important to develop muscle strength, balance, and muscle and nervous system control. Using the correct equipment, like shoes and so forth. Be aware of correct exercise technique, so-called biomechanics. Use protection for previously injured areas, <clears throat> if appropriate. Make sure that you are well nourished and you get the good nutrients in. And let me just give you a very practical example. If you've got a low bone density, osteopenia, you're more likely to develop fractures. And dietary uh, aspects around that are very important. Also, psychological status is linked to injury risk. And then also, certain other lifestyle habits, like smoking. There's a direct relation between smoking and a high risk of injury for many reasons. I'm not going to go into that. What I want to tell you, though, is that 50% or more of these exercise-related injuries are preventable. And again, that's, there are many health professionals in this room, biokineticists, physios, sports scientists, and so on, who this is their business to make sure that we don't get injured uh, and to prevent injuries. So let me give you one example of how you can prevent an injury, very practical example, because I hope that all of you are going to start walking and climbing stairs tomorrow. But here's the thing, don't overdo it because you develop an injury. So let's give you, let me give you an example. If at the moment you are really doing not that much, but you're doing something which is good, and your average exercise over the last four weeks was 20 minutes of exercise in, the, in a week, this is not much really, but 20 minutes of exercise in a week, and now, because of tonight, you are planning to increase your exercise in the next week to 40 minutes. From an injury point of view, is that a good idea or not? Now, very clever scientists, and I was also very fortunate to be part of an expert group that was published a paper around this last year. Uh, there's a very fancy word or very terminology for it. It's called the acute on chronic load ratio. It really is the average exercise you've done in the past four weeks and either what you're doing this week or what you're planning on doing this week and just getting the ratio of those two. So a very simple calculation, that 40 over there, which is what you're planning on over the 20, gives you a score of two. What does that mean? Well, here's the, here's the fa fancy graph for you. This comes from the British Journal of Sports Medicine in June 2016 last year, and you'll see it has got Soligard, Tobion, and Schwellness in there. And we worked with a lot of group of people, and there's data to show that there's a link between your injury risk and this load. And, that, and your, what we've just calculated was that the two is over here, and that's too much of a jump from one week to the next. There is a danger zone around a greater than that ratio of 1.5, where your injury risk goes up. It's better to be in the sweet spot and have a reduced injury risk. 
So a safer progression, if you were doing the 20 minutes, you can now calculate backwards and say it's a ratio of 1.2 to 1.5. That's around, I must up it from 24 to 30 minutes, not up to 40 minutes. Very easy and a very important rule, probably one of the most important rules, which is the science behind the too much, too soon, too frequently that uh, Tim wrote in his book, I think, 30 years ago. The next side effect is the risk of medical complications. And these can be quite a, a large number of medical complications that can happen while you're exercising. The biggest one that gets the most press is acute cardiovascular events, cardiac arrest and sudden death, but other things that you can get, heat stroke and all sorts of things, and other minor complications. For the doctors that are here, if you're starting to see patients that you're giving a, a, an exercise program to, they may develop brand new symptoms because exercise is a physiological stressor and will unmask uh, underlying disease or injuries. That's why I just put that little one uh, marker there just to remind me to tell you that. Very important part of what I see uh, are brand new diseases, cancer and thyroid problems, but in exercising individuals because exercise unmasks that. So let me go through a few things. This is not designed to scare you at all, but it is the reality. So we've already established that if over a 24-hour period, the person who exercises regularly has a risk of dying, which is arbitrarily around there, which is 50%, 30 to 50% lower than someone who doesn't exercise. So that's good. You're a regular exerciser, you have got half the risk over a 24-hour period to die uh, compared to the person who doesn't. Here's a bit of bad news that while you're exercising, in that 30 minutes or 60 minutes of exercising, while you're doing your hard exercise, that's that peak, the one hour of exercise, there could be a two up to a 56 times higher risk of developing a medical complication in that exercise hour. So I was actually thinking, thinking about this because before this uh, talk, I went for a run, Maquena, I will remember, I went for a run around uh, the sports campus and I thought to myself, Martin, where, where are you on this thing? Thinking that, well, maybe Professor Delaray won't have an expert lecturer this evening. <laughs> the question is, is the risk the same for everyone all the time? And the answer is clearly not. Okay? So this is a, maybe a little bit of complicated. That's the original slide I had there. And these are three different bars. So there's a lower risk, really low risk, if you're younger, got no risk factors compared to somebody who is exercising with risk factors, in other words, the possibility of yet undiagnosed underlying disease, against somebody who has existing chronic disease while they're exercising. And that's, you know, each of us are perhaps at a slightly different risk. And we need to be aware of that if we're going to do what we're supposed to do, which is our daily drug. So here's the drug shelf. Exercise comes in different doses and so forth. There are different groups of people. There's a different risk profile in the person who is, decides to exercise. And of course, there are different types of exercises. It could be jogging, running a half marathon, playing a bit of social tennis, racing in a seven-day mountain bike risk, or participating in a triathlon. And the question is, how well is your own uh, risk profile matched to what you want to do? So should, what type of drug should I be picking if I'm this person or this person or that person from this box? And that you may need some help with. Because if you don't, you'll be like this gentleman who was a 70-year-old male who had high blood pressure and high blood fats who went and participated in a triathlon in 2015 in Cape Town and ended up like that. And Dr. Jan Killips, who's a student and colleague of mine, was the person looking after, trying to look after him. So there is a risk. Now, we studied these risks uh, in, 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 participating, uh, in, in, in people participating in what we would call mass community-based events. So it could be anything from a fun run or a 10K run, but we particularly studied, at that time I was in Cape Town, the, the Two Oceans Marathons. And we found that you have... Uh, a fairly high risk of a serious life-threatening complication. And we thought, how could we change this? And we questioned whether or not we shouldn't be doing some screening of people beforehand. And I published this paper uh, about eight weeks ago, which has attracted quite a lot of attention in the international world, where I argued for screening. And I argued for screening because we looked at this. Over a number of years, we've done 
studies which we've designed uh, we, and implemented, and we call them the strategies to reduce adverse, adverse is just a medical term for bad, uh, medical events for the exerciser. And these are the main landmark studies, and they're probably, if you were to ask me what sort of contribution have IPAPs made to this, this would probably be one of the main contributions. And it's attracted enough attention to f be a special edition of the British Journal of Sports Mission, the Safer Studies. And if you can read it, my name is over there, together with my good colleague Wayne Derman. So what is this all about? Well, there are international guidelines written by very, very good people that have given us guidelines on what we should do, what questions should you be asking, and I'll be asking you, if I'm going to look after you, about what should you do to put your eye to the green, the orange, or the red risk of that peak while you're exercising. We want you to exercise, but we want you to do it safely. So these are two guidelines. This is the most well-known. These are European guidelines uh, by my good colleague, Mats Burrison, and then these are the Canadian guidelines. And this is just a picture of myself. I was very privileged to become a good friend of Matt's and also Jonathan Dresner, who's a cardiologist uh, from Seattle. And uh, this was in the Swedish archipelago. We were doing heavy science. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't uh, traveling on UP's uh, expense. But uh, Matt's Bjornsson is coming to, uh, to, to South Africa soon, and, um, and we've been working together for a number of years on exactly this. So what are these uh, guidelines? What are the things? What are the golden rules? I gave you the 10 golden rules for injury prevention. What are the golden rules for screening? So if you're a male over the age of 45 with more than one risk factor, you should see your doctor before you go and exercise, particularly high intensity to, to prolonged exercise. Similarly, if you're a female over the age of 55 with more than one risk factor. If you've got any known, if you're known uh, patient with cardiovascular disease, definitely see a doctor. So these are all the conditions for medical clearance. If you develop any symptoms or have any symptoms of cardiovascular disease, and I mentioned a few, I didn't want to make the slide too big, chest pain, dizziness, shortness of breath. Obviously, if you're pregnant as a female, if you use any prescription medication for chronic disease, that's not a universally accepted criteria, but we've got some very good data from the Two Oceans data, which is the largest data set in the world now on this, which, will, uh, which supports that. Also, any other known underlying chronic disease, ranging from cancer, lung disease, diabetes, kidney, etc. If you develop any symptoms during the exercise, don't ignore that. There's not an issue of no pain, no gain. If you develop symptoms, then you need to go and see someone to find out why and make sure that you um, don't have an underlying condition. If you have any concerns yourself, and I want to emphasize this one particularly, there was a few, a few months ago, uh, a young boy, uh, Neil, you remember, for, uh, who had developed heart pro uh, viral myocarditis uh, when he was playing rugby for one of the teams in Pretoria schools. And he was exercising while he had an acute flu-like illness. That's a contraindication to exercise, and we need to be aware of that. But these things are also preventable. 60% of these complications can be reduced through a screening and education program. And then these are data that uh, have not yet been published, but they have been presented uh, this year, a few weeks ago, I think about six weeks ago, in, in the American College of Sports Medicine's annual meeting, where we have shown that if we screen, for four years we've screened, and in the preceding four years we didn't screen. When we say screen and in, in, in educational intervention. In the two oceans races, we were able to reduce serious life-threatening complications, including cardiovascular complications, by 62% and particularly in the half marathon race by 71%. Generally, the half marathon population is not as healthy as the ultra marathon population. So this was a 71% reduction by introducing a screening and educational prevention program. And this attracted the attention of that conference, which has got more than 6,000 delegates. And I was very, very uh, uh, f uh, humbled to receive the award for the International Clinical in Scholar Award first South African uh, to be able to achieve that at the American College of Sports Medicine meeting. That's not the issue. The issue is that the screening and educational intervention program could make a big difference. So we're going to publish these papers and I think it will change uh, the way people think about exercise and particularly running mass community events. So I want to summarize the health benefits and risks by this graph. If you do light, moderate daily activity, you'll see the benefits over here in green are rapid and, 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 and there's a big benefit from doing nothing 
to even just doing fairly little, big benefit. And the risk generally is quite low. When you get to this end of the spectrum and you're really training for fitness and really a hard strenuous activity, the risk climbs, and I've given you the, the data for that. And we need to give uh, attention to how we train people and the loads and so forth around that to reduce that risk. Okay, so I'm going to finish with two, three slides now on what is it that you need to take. What is this prescription of the drug? So you know you should take it. Hopefully you know why you should take it. You know the side effects of the drug, but now it comes down to writing the prescription. I'm going to write this prescription for you. And basically what it is is the following. More than 30 minutes um, uh, is sustained exercise is the best way to take the drug. You need to take it on most days of the week. It needs to be a fairly high dose. So we talk about 60 to 80 percent of your maximum capacity. You can measure that very sophisticated ways. Essentially, while you're exercising, you should be able to just conduct a conversation is a good way. If, it's, if you're breathing too hard, you can't talk, then slow down. If you talk too much, then speak up the speed. <laughs> the type of exercise, two most important components. We talk about endurance activity. That's the sort of long, uh, slow distance kind of activity. Walking, jogging, cycling, swimming, triathlons, and many others. It's where you are constantly doing the same type of activity. And then muscle strength and flexibility, I didn't really talk too much about, but this is the component that's responsible for the reduction of osteoarthritis and falling and so forth. Very important part. So in summary then, the dose of this drug that you should all be taking is 150 minutes of moderate to high intensity exercise per week. And you should in try to include some strength and balance training two to three times a week. So I found this, which is a very nice, uh, you know, if you need to remember this. There are four practical tips. You need to sweat, you need to step, you need to sleep, and you need to sit less. Those are the four S's that you can apply. And it makes a nice four. Sweating, you need to increase the amount of sweating you're doing, but it doesn't have to be the main component. Stepping, important in terms of the number of hours. Get enough sleep, not too much, not too little. And sitting should just be less and less and less. It should be zero, really, if we can. Of course, we can't. <laughs> All right, so let's see if we can get the last questions going. And so I want you to log in again. Okay, I'm sorry. I think uh, I may have... Uh, let me just see if I can go back to the uh, next question. If not, then we'll skip it, but I want to try and... Okay, I apologize for that. I seem to have lost the last question. So, we're going to just finish off with... Um, this question. And remember to um, quick it, type it in quickly, 16 seconds left. You need more people to vote. Four, four seconds left. Okay. I think we've done well. That is the correct answer, 150 minutes per week at a moderate to high intensity exercise. The 10,000 steps, in case you're wondering about that, that's what you should try and do daily. If you've got a step count on your phone or you've got a wearable device, try and do the 10,000 steps per day. Um, and weight training, five days a week, I mean, some people, I'm not saying that's wrong, you could do that, but it's uh, not the optimum dose for, for your health. Right, so... I want to finish off with this. What is your why statement for health today? And I'd like you to think about this one, and then I'm going to do this by a show of hands. Uh, and the question is, can you make the statement to me now and commit yourself to it that when I leave this room today, in the next one minute, I'm going to commit myself and encourage others to perform safe, and given the guidelines for safe, physical activity daily. And that is the why for my health and for those uh, around me. 
So let's put up our hands. If you're going to commit yourself, this is like a preacher. Getting, yeah, put up your hand. I won't watch, but I will watch. <laughs> if you can commit yourself, put your hand up. And that is the public commitment that, that we're all going to do this in order to be healthy South Africans. Thank you very much for your attention and I appreciate your time. Colleagues, uh, not only did we get a very entertaining and intellectual lecture, but also a free script. It's not every day that that's happening. Uh, let's once again thank Professor Schwellness for a very good lecture. Thank you. I'm going to allow one or two brief questions to Professor Schwellness. You can leave the personal questions still uh, for, during the refreshment time. Uh, there at the back, we've got one, and then in front. Have we got a roaming Okay, that's a very good question, and uh, there are many, many different ways to do that. We basically do that by an exercise test of a variety of different sorts. It could be a step test, it could be a treadmill test on a, on a treadmill, it could be a bicycle test, etc. And then we measure how your body responds to that. So we measure, for instance, the, the, the gold standard, if you like, is to me measure your oxygen consumption and your maximal oxygen consumption, and that's called the VO2 peak or the VO2 max. That's one way. We can also measure your heart rate and how your heart rate responds to as the exercise gets harder and how your heart rate responds. We can also measure how your heart rate comes down, how quickly it comes down when you stop exercise. Those are just a few examples. But it is genetically determined. So when it becomes a little bit tricky when I measure all of you and then to say, uh, you fitter than you are than you are. We know that your, your uh, ability to adapt to um, an exercise training response is roughly about 15% improvement. So I can change my VO2 peak by about 15%. Um, so it's more important about where you, you know, what, how much you can change and how, how, where you are on your own spectrum from being completely inactive and unfit to where what your maximum ability is. Because mine, my maximum ability is way below Bruce Fordyce's minimum ability. Um, does that answer the question? So the answer to your question about does it change things like learning ability, concentration, attention span, quality, you know, productivity at work, uh, even things like absenteeism in a business setting, absolutely. The biggest problem we have, which is what I try to address in a way this evening, is the why question. Why are they not doing it or why they should be doing it? And so at the moment people grapple not so much about convincing people to exercise, is the how to get people to do it. And so that applies to a student population, it applies to a school going population, it applies to you know, the period between birth and before going to school. And if I can just extend one, make one important observation uh, from research that's done in pregnant women who exercise regularly, their children are better at uh, um, attaining um, and then the milestones, the normal physical milestones, and things like learning and so on. 
And they're data to show up to five years after giving birth. Just an interesting fact that exercise starts even while you're pregnant for your child or your unborn child. Um, and so it's the message that's the problem. Okay, good. Uh, uh, well, the first question is really uh, uh, easy to answer. The, and we, we are just reconfiguring the facilities on the sports campus at the HPC building. Um, and we are definitely, the Institute, the Sport Exercise Medicine Lifestyle Institute, University of Pretoria, is there for the public and the community. So we will definitely be a place to come to for any assistance with any of that. As far as... Um, uh, Individuals and particularly athletes with disability. I was very fortunate to be part of the International Paralympic Committee Medical Committee. So I've been at the last three Paralympic Games in London and the Winter Games in Sochi and now in Rio. And we're doing quite a lot of research on, on this population. Uh, the focus to date has been mostly on improving their sports performance, but we've been uh, involved in making them also aware of the health problems and the injury risk problems in these athletes, which are higher actually than, than in able-bodied um, athletes. Um, and just a last point about that, uh, any person with a disability is at a much higher risk, I didn't put the data in here, of dying from non-communicable disease than you and me. So the problem is even bigger in that special group of people. Colleagues, we need to conclude this event and um, I would like to acknowledge Professor Cheryl De La Rey, our VC and Principal, for hosting this event and also for her introductory message and her continuous leadership and support to the faculty and specifically to SEMLI. Um, you will hear much more about this institute in future. Thank you, Professor De La Rey. Uh, Professor Schwellness for making the faculty proud once again, for giving us food for thought, and then also for asking the why question. Uh, we really enjoyed your presentation tonight. Staff uh, of the Sport, Exercise, Medicine and Lifestyle Institute, the family at work, in addition to the support from the family at home, thanks uh, for that. The Department of University Relations, specifically Shireen and uh, Lynette Smith, for organizing this event. And then also I need to um, acknowledge the uh, participation of colleagues from outside the University of Pretoria tonight. Thanks for joining us. I hope it's not going to be the first and the last time. Um, it's always great to welcome you uh, on our campus. But also our colleagues from other um, uh, faculties and also uh, friends and colleagues, students, from Health Sciences. Um, colleagues, you are all invited to have refreshments outside, and after that the aerobics class will start on, on the lawn. Thanks for, for attending. Thank you.